How's Oshkosh going so far? How many people have arrived in the last day or so? And how many people have been here pretty much all week, like since Sunday or Monday? Look at that. A lot, a lot of, how many people have been to an Air Safety Institute seminar before here at Oshkosh? That's awesome. A lot of repeat offenders out there. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you for putting some mind share into safety while you're here at Oshkosh. So the topic this morning, just to kick this off, is let me tell you how this kind of got started in the Air Safety Institute. We've addressed this topic before. Many people have. But earlier this year, there was an accident, a really tragic accident in Pembroke Pines, Florida, where a bonanza took off. The NTSB hasn't finished its investigation, so I need to caveat it with that. But it appears as if he attempted a turn back to the runway with uh, tragic results. He didn't make it back. and you know, really tragically took out a civilian on the ground, a young child uh, attempted to make it back. And so we realized that that is going to regenerate this topic again. And the FAA put out an advisory circular that was also somewhat controversial that encouraged uh, instructors to teach the turn back. Not necessarily teach it, but teach the dynamics of it, when it's right, when it's wrong. So the whole topic is somewhat controversial. So we decided after the Pembroke Pines accident to take uh, four aircraft up and just demonstrate and see for ourselves what the turn, turn back felt like. I'll get into that a little bit later. So I want to introduce uh, people that are uh, graciously joined me on this uh, panel with their bulletproof vests on. Um, so Dave Hirschman, you may know him as editor at large at AOPA Pilot Magazine. I have yet to see the airplane that Dave can't fly. Uh, it's amazing all the stuff that he's seen. One of the colleagues I have, one of the instructors that I turn to when I need a, a tune up or a top off. Dave's got a lot of experience and at one time uh, had a surface uh, aerobatic uh, competency card, which is pretty difficult to get. He's had a lot of time in uh, Warbirds. And uh, he's had, I think, three engine failures, dead stick landings. Dave, is that right? One was in a Dauntless that he dead sticked into a grass strip. So um, more experience than he wants to have in engine failures. <laughs> So, Dave, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks. Glad to be here. And you probably also know Brian Schiff. Uh, so Brian Schiff likes to describe himself as a pilot who first learned to fly IFR because he couldn't see over the panel of his dad's airplane when he learned to fly. He got all of his ratings, his licenses at the earliest possible opportunity you could get them. He's still dominantly a CFI, and I find that interesting. That's how he likes to describe himself, even though he's an airline captain as well. Uh, he's done a lot of writing. He gives a very good seminar on the turn back and how to execute it, how to prepare for it, how to think through it. It's much more detailed than what you're going to give here. And I think you're giving that talk tomorrow at 11 at the NAFI tent? Tomorrow at 1130 at the NAFI tent, yeah. Okay, good. So if you want more detail on the actual execution of it and things to think about, um, stop by that. It's, it's an excellent uh, seminar. So let's get into like how big of a problem is this in terms of engine failure on takeoff. This is a, a Pareto chart. So I serve on the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee. I'm the co-chair of that committee with an FAA counterpart. And one of the things we do is just study general aviation safety and come up with enhancements in ways that we can continue to drive safety in general aviation. You can't, it's a bit of an eye chart, but that top long bar is loss of control. That's about 45% or so of fatal accidents occur in some type of loss of control. Now, um, there's, there's a lot under loss of control, so there's a, there's a lot of things in there, but that's the dominant category. And then next you can see is uh, that's system component failure power plant, basically engine failure. So um, you can see that's really number two, but substantially uh, down and not that much more above the, uh, the other things that you see there. So what does that translate into? These are engine failure statistics in terms of takeoff and initial climb out. You can see how many of those we've had over about an eight-year period. I think that starts in 2010 up to 2018, which is the latest full data we have from the NTSB. The red is the fatal rate. You can see, on average, about 10 a year fatal accidents from an engine failure on takeoff, so not quite one a month. Um, we don't know whether they attempted turn back or went straight ahead or what the conditions were, so that's unknown. And what we don't know are the engine failures that ended up successfully, whether the pilot went straight ahead and landed in a field or turned back and landed successfully. It's a big limitation in our data. A lot of times that's not reported, so we don't know about it. 
So let's move on to the turn back discussion and how this sort of came to be. And um, guys, at this point, this is really a joint conversation, so I'm really inviting my colleagues who, um, who know a lot about this topic to help me in this conversation. But um, so uh, the turn back controversy really, uh, it really kind of started again when the FAA put out this advisory circular uh, what was it, Brian, maybe four years ago, something like that? Yeah, it was about three, four years ago. Yeah, when it came out. And basically, they encouraged instructors to teach the turn back. And in many circles, that was controversial because, as you may know, for the longest time, it was taught straight ahead. Engine failure on takeoff, plus or minus 30 degrees of your nose, go straight ahead. Largely due to the research and the writing of um, Brian's dad, Barry Schiff, the FAA sort of reconsidered that. Now, they did so very carefully. As you can see, the caveats there, they said, you should sort of teach pilots about this, this uh, parameter, this technique, this process, but you'd also be very careful to talk to them about the room that's needed, the altitude that's needed to do it safely, and um, where I think the limitation is, Brian, and you had concerns with this circular. So do you, would you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so the FAA said, yes, this is a topic that needs to be taught, but there was no guidance put out to to instructors as to how to teach it. The advisory circular actually is instructing flight instructor refresher courses to encourage instructors to teach the turn back and teach all the safety aspects of when to do it and how to do it. And there's not a lot of guidance on that. And I, th and I think what's going to happen is we're going to have to have an industry, a group of industry experts get together and, and agree on what's the best way to teach it as well. Yeah. Well, uh, just let me jump in. As an active CFI, how do you teach it? Uh, how I come, come by tomorrow at 11.30 and I'll show you the specifics of it. But what I do is we go up to altitude and we learn certain, how to maneuver the aircraft, first of all, at a safe altitude. And I, and I don't want pilots out there trying this by themselves. Get with an instructor who has come up with a method. But I go to altitude and we, we practice maneuvering. We learn the altitude loss. We figure out what can happen. But all the time while doing this, I'm stressing this, the rule of the day still remains to go straight ahead. If you've got a great field in front of you, this should not be attempted. It's only when it's more hazardous than not doing so that a pilot should turn back to the airport. And that kind of brings us to that second bullet, the, the view on this in industry is somewhat mixed. So you have, but even though you have some proponents who say turn back is an option that needs to be in your toolkit, you have some people that say never turn back, you're always going to be safer to go straight ahead. Most people generally are in the, in the center stream that say if you've got an option to go straight ahead, that is your safer option take the straight ahead option, but there are some places where that's just not a very good option, and you need to know that turn back can be an option for you based on a lot of parameters. And I think that's why I invited these two to come up here. Brian and his dad Barry have done a lot of work on this can be an option for you. I think Dave's experience, and you'll hear this later when he flew the Bonanza in our test, sort of reinforced his perspective that he's really disinclined to turn back and to, uh, and to keep straight ahead. Fair assessment, Dave? That's of fair. Your, okay. Yeah, and I like Brian? That also. And I think that not only where is a factor as to whether you should or shouldn't do it, but who is a factor, and also the aircraft is a factor. Some airplanes are obviously better suited to do it than others, so there are a lot, there's a, every aircraft, every takeoff, every pilot in an airport has a different fingerprint as to when and how this should be done. And as I mentioned, the accident statistics are really inconclusive, because we just don't have enough data on the ones that make it back successfully. So. Um, a little bit on the, the turn back theory. There's a study that was done by this by the FAA, and they stress uh, quite accurately, I might add, that uh, there are added risks to turning back. So even if, and you'll hear the caveats, we'll put in it later, that you decide this is a good option for you, your airplane can do it, you're trained for it, you're ready for it, all that stuff, it's still going to carry elevated risks based on a straight ahead departure. And the biggest risk in there is an uncoordinated turn back. And we learned this when we were practicing it both at altitude and uh, on the ground in the video you'll see that after you lose the engine, you have such a strong tendency to want to see that turn rate increase and see the nose come around and see the runway that there's a subconscious tendency to put bottom rudder inside that. And when that happens, you're going to stall at uncoordinated stall and you won't have time to recover from the spin. So that's the, really the biggest risk of uh, this maneuver and it's, and it's a, a risk to be considered. You'll have substantial loss from your airspeed. So we initially took off and decided we were going to try to simulate the startle factor. So 
I'm a former Air Force pilot, and every, every parameter that the Air Force teaches, whether it's decision points on runway or engine failure or whatever, they factor in a three-second startle period where the pilot is going, what's going on? Oh, I get it, it's an engine failure, and they, and they react. Different studies say different things. This FAA study said on average it was four seconds. What I found was in the study in the, when I was flying the Super Cub, you simply cannot wait four seconds. You will, you, if you try to hold everything just as it is to simulate that, you will stall the airplane. So um, we used a three-second startle period to simulate that. Again, much of this is open for discussion, and that's why we wanted to put the video out there, because it is a good discussion to have. It is a good plan to have premeditated. And uh, that's one of the takeaways from you here today is, if you think this is right for you and you can do it, it's a premeditated decision, as Brian said, based on the footprint of where you are in your airplane, your proficiency, there's a couple factors to consider. So um, with that, here's some uh, interesting uh, sort of dynamics on the turn back. So the first thing is you can see that inside circle, and you can see that uh, that's only 16 seconds from engine failure to turn back. However, that's about 60 degrees of bank. And what we did in our study, and what we found, and I think, Brian, you also advocate for this, is that the more bank angle you have, then the more G you're going to put on the aircraft, and the higher your stall speed due to the acceleration there, due to the G you're putting on the airplane. So we thought, and um, I still believe, based on this scenario here, that 45 degrees of bank is about right. There's enough safety margin in there. It's about that middle line in there, so it doesn't get you back as fast but it gets you back faster than, say, a 30-degree bank, which is on the outside of that. Because what you're really working in this engine failure is time, time and distance. How far are you from the runway, and how long can you stay airborne? So as you can see, the, the tighter your bank angle, the closer you're into the runway, the less time that you have to glide, and therefore, the more time you have to use the altitude available to you. So, those are important, pretty important things to think through. That 45 degrees bank seemed about right for us. The more you go over that, the riskier it is that you're going to get into that stall scenario, accelerated stall, and, and um, especially if it's uncoordinated. So now what I'd like to do is, uh, before I go in, I'm going to share with you the videos that we did, and I'll set this up a little bit. In fact, Dave, I've been talking enough. You want to set these up? You, you and I sort of came up with this idea. Set up the uh, experiment for us. Sure. We're, we went to uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia, where they have this gigantic, you know, 9,000 foot runway. And uh, we worked it out with the controllers to, to explain what we wanted to do, got permission. And then uh, we picked just an absolutely beautiful flying day for this experiment. We realized that everybody doesn't have a, uh, a 9,000 foot long, 200 foot wide runway to fly from. So uh, what we did is we positioned the, the airplanes um, further down the runway so that we were, we were taken off not quite from midfield to give it a, you know, to, to give it a, a more realistic look and feel. Also, you'll see in the video that, um, that there's a, a clear area um, where that's, that's uh, very few obstacles and, and some open fields on the way back to the, uh, to the uh, runway so that if a simulated engine failure became a real engine failure, we'd have some place to go. And, uh, and we had four airplanes. Richard went first in his Super Cub, followed by um, uh, me in, in my personal airplane, an RV4 with a constant speed prop. Uh, Luz Beatty was next in a, uh, in a, a pretty stock Cessna 172. And uh, finally, uh, Dave Roy, uh, a, a, a colleague and friend, uh, went out in uh, Tom Haynes' former Bonanza, which now belongs to Mike Ginter, of, of, all within AOPA. But it's a, a, a A36 Bonanza, full fuel tanks, two aboard, about 40 pounds of, of baggage. And um, and uh, and we we uh, we simulated the the uh, the turn back in the uh, in the Bonanza. Yeah, that was important. We felt uh, there was an open space there, and we had runway both behind us and in front of us because uh, I watched Paul Bertarelli's video when he did this in a J3, and he found that if you get high enough, you can't get down uh, fast enough and slow enough. You'll run off the end of the runway on the other side. So we had runway either side of us, and we had safety observers on the ground, and we also put one in the Bonanza 
uh, because we thought that was going to be the more difficult airplane, and it turned out to be very true. Um, so let's watch these uh, turn back videos. You'll see the cameras there, and we'll start, and I'll narrate the first one that I did in my Super Cub. So to give you an idea of um, uh, the experience level here, everybody in this experiment was, is a CFI. Um, all of us were highly proficient. We went up uh, airborne before we did the turn backs to try to figure out how much uh, airspace we would need. We, we use a technique that's inspired by Brian's, but it's not his exact technique on how to determine uh, altitude. So basically what we did is we went up to altitude, we cut the power, we established the waited three seconds, established a 45 degree bank, and turned for 360 degrees to see how much altitude we would lose. Based on that, we padded it a little bit, and then we came back and tried the turn backs. Brian, you're going to talk about this at length tomorrow, I'm sure, but your technique is a little bit different than that. I am, yes. It's, it's a little bit different, and there are other factors that I also tried to include. I had a 50% margin on that. I also include, uh, because of climb angle and runway length, I have a rule of thumb that uh, we've calculated the math, and it turns out that if, if you're not two-thirds of that pre-calculated height, when you cross over the end of the runway, don't turn back, you're not going to make it. The runway is too short. Or, For example, if you're climbing one mile out, you're one foot high. It's an exaggeration, but obviously you're not going to make it back to the runway. So the two-thirds of that number is very important that if you haven't crossed the end of the runway. Those other factors are considering turning into the wind and also if you're in an airplane that, like a Bonanza, you, you might want to consider taking a 30-degree head start, doing a teardrop depart, you know, right turn, downwind, so you can make a into the wind turn back. Uh, and one caveat I also want to mention is that this is not something that we advocate. The straight ahead is still what I'd like to do most of the time if you have a field in front of you. The only time I would advocate the turn back is when it's more hazardous not to turn back. Okay, so let's watch the uh, Super Cub. Whoops, okay, I think I just I had a slide for all that. <laughs> so that's, that's all the stuff uh, that Dave just talked about. Um, and our engines were in idle. So let me talk about that for a little bit. Our engines were in idle, and so some people say that that's uh, probably a wash because uh, a, a windmilling propeller will create more drag than a propeller that's still. But an idle engine is producing some level of thrust, so we probably got some benefit from our engines being in idle. So how much? Really hard to determine. Probably not a lot, but probably some. So here's the super cut. All right, here we go. Let's go. Let's do this one at 300 feet. You can cut the sound on that. Yeah. So we climbed out between VX and VY um, as a general rule. And I think here in the Super Cup, I was climbing out about 60 miles an hour. Over to the right, you can see is the Air National Guard uh, with a bunch of C-17s. So that's why we decided not to turn to the right. We didn't want to get their attention. Um, you can see all the open space that Dave mentioned uh, to the left. So here, as you can see, the prop slow and the engine failure, the three second delay. And now what's important is immediately pitching the nose down to best glide and getting into the uh, uh, getting into 45 degrees of bank. I think it's a very important point, pitching down. A lot of pilots, when this happens and they startle, will pull. You've got to push. If we had the sound on here, you would hear my stall horn bleeping here. The stall horns probably goes off about five to seven miles an hour, somewhere in there above stall speed. I've actually found that to be helpful. Um, and my estimation on this was um, we, we did it on a simulated 4,000 foot runway. I estimated here I could make it back to a 2,000 foot runway. So in my 360 degree turn that I mentioned, I lost about 300 feet of altitude. So I thought that you know is where I was going to start. But I started my first ones at uh, 500 feet. So I flew up to 500 feet, cut the engine, turned back. And what I found on those first ones was I couldn't lose the altitude and the airspeed fast enough. I ran off the simulated runway at the other end. So. Um, that's why uh, at 300 feet, it felt like a relatively comfortable maneuver. So my takeaway was a little bit more nuanced than what Brian mentioned. My takeaway from this is in a Super Cub, with me a very proficient uh, pilot with a lot of experience and a lot of experience in that Super Cub, when the conditions are like that, the turn back is a very good option for me 
at the right altitude under the right conditions. So it's definitely something to keep in my tool bag, but it's something that you have to be ready for and you have to be proficient in. So that was my experience. And I think to add to that, also, I have a Cetabria with a 180 horsepower engine. And every, like I said, every airplane is different. It's definitely something to keep in the toolkit for my airplane. But if I climb out normally, I'll turn back. I can't make the airport. It's almost below me because of the climb angle that we have. So when I'm at an airport where there's nowhere to go, like Catalina or Hawthorne or one of these airports, there's just, there is no option. I will actually climb shallower, and that's a lot different than you would think that you would need to be do. I will climb a shallower climb, and I know exactly how to do it so that when I, I will have the altitude to turn back, but I won't be too high to turn back. At some point, I might just be at pattern altitude where I can turn and, and fly a conventional pattern and land into the wind. So it depends on your aircraft, and you need to know your aircraft. You climb shallower in that Cetabria because of that dynamic where you're afraid you can't lose the altitude and the airspeed in time? Correct. I won't make it back to the airport. If, yeah. if, I, if the airport is an only option, and I'm at that airport where there's nothing around except the airport to land, yeah. then I will climb out shallower and also make an offset turn if, I, if the tower will let me. But yeah, I'll climb out shallower so that I can make it back to the airport without overshooting. Without overshooting on the backside. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Dave, uh, I think this is you up next in the RV4, so I'll let you narrate this, uh, this one. Okay, this is uh, the tail camera on my RV4, 160 horsepower, constant speed prop. I'm solo in the airplane and the, the tanks are full. I'm doing a fairly normal uh, climb out, you know, pretty much uh, more, more like VY because uh, cylinder cooling is typically what I'm thinking about during a normal takeoff. So I'm climbing to 1,000 feet AGL, and then I'll, I'll commence the turn back. I've got to confess to um, a little, uh, you guys kind of hurt my feelings on this, because I'm the only one that doesn't consistently make it back to the airport. I'm the only one that, that keeps, keeps landing short. Everybody else uh, seems, to, seems to do this with ease. But um, here we are approaching the 1,000 uh, the, uh, foot AGL point. Um, in the, in the RV4, the difference between making it back and not making it back is a timely reduction in the RPMs, pulling the, the, uh, the prop lever to course pitch. So here I'm starting the turn back. You'll notice it's a little shallow of, the, of, of 45 degrees. I'm looking outside, as you can see from there, and I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to position myself over this clear path, this, this green area below to make it back to the runway. There you see the runway at 12 o'clock. Flaps are up, best, you know, we're in the best glide configuration. I'm uh, approaching at about uh, 80 to 85 knots, which is about my best glide speed. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna make a no flap landing, but you'll see that it's, it, that it's like, we just, it's, it's pretty marginal as to, as to whether we get back or not. You see that displaced threshold, I'm, 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 I'm trying my very best to make it. Power is at idle, and now I'm just uh, I'm, I'm turning to, uh, to line up with the runway, and we touch down at, at roughly the 1,000-foot uh, thousand, thousand marker, the um, fixed distance markers. So Dave, you flew it three times, and I think you said you made it back two out of three times. I was two out of three in the, in the RV4, and, uh, and the first one, I just left the prop at fine pitch. You know, I think I was at, at 2,500 RPM. I thought, you know, how many of us, would, if, would I have the presence of mind to do that prop reduction if I had been startled and lost the engine for real? So the first one, I just left the prop in fine pitch, high RPM, didn't make it back to the runway. The next two, I, I did reduce the, uh, the uh, engine prop RPM and barely made it back to the runway in the RV4. In my experience, it's about a 20% difference with you go to low RPM or not. It makes a big difference, I, I believe. And, and Richard, you mentioned something that's very important about the stall warning horn going off, and you said and that was a good thing. Because uh, you're looking out the window, and you're, you're trying to find the airport and fly and, and, and get a bank angle. Respect the stall warning, and that's going to give you an indication of right where you should be. Maybe glide speed is what your target is, but if you hear the stall warning, respect it and, and pitch down. 
And it, and it reinforced to me uh, the importance of that coordinated turn in there. So I wasn't watching airspeed as much as I was looking outside and looking at my knee to ball. Because I knew that un, an uncoordinated turn, one, it's inefficient, so I'm going to lose that glide distance I need. And two, that's really where the danger is of being uncoordinated. Absolutely. Keeping coordinated is utmost important. So I found I was watching that, looking outside, and then I, I wasn't expecting it, but when the stall horn went off, I thought, oh, that's, that's going to help me because I'm going to play right on the edge of that stall horn could, because this is a max performance maneuver. You know, when you're, if you're going to attempt to turn back like that, you're max performing your airplane. One little piece of information that I discovered from test flying of this with, with Dad as well is, is the stopped prop thing. We, we did go overhead an airport at a pretty relatively high altitude, safe altitude, and we shut down the engine. And the, uh, what I found is when you shut down an engine intentionally, you have the throttle back, and with the throttle closed, you're likely, you can't keep the, the prop going. They say you have to pitch up a lot to try to stop the prop, and stopping the prop will give you a lot of better performance than a windmilling prop. But if your engine, depending on why it failed, if it's still tight and you pull the throttle closed, you're going to probably stop the prop because it's closing up that and creating a vacuum in there the propeller can't overcome. Yeah. Just a little extra bonus information. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was the RV4. Anything else on the RV4, Dave? Um, by the way, we've got a lot of feedback on this. Go on our YouTube channel. There's a lot of interaction there, which is why we did this. You know, we, we certainly don't know everything about this topic. There's some really good uh, engagement on our YouTube channel about uh, this. We've gotten a lot of calls and, and letters, and some of them is, uh, I just talked yesterday to a gentleman that owns an RV8, and he had attempted this previously before our video came out, and he was kind of excited. To, I met him here yesterday, and he said, hey, I have an RV8. I've tried this multiple times. I'm convinced you cannot make it in an RV8. So um, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, meanwhile, who is it, Dave? A Pilatus, I think, that uh, called in and said, I think it was a Pilatus, and said uh, he's practiced this as well. He's a military pilot. They use it for military reasons. And he says a Pilatus does very well in a turn back exercise. So I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, so, tur turbo well, prop with the, the, that goes to feathers, you know, feathers the, the blades, that's, a, that's a, a major drag reduction, sure. I think that's part of their training program as well. Okay, uh, here's Luz Beatty in the uh, Skyhawk uh, 172. And um, Luz went up to, she tried it first at 800 feet, I think, and made that, and then tried it a couple times at 600 feet. And as we'll see here, um, I think we'll see the same thing. She doesn't even really feel like she needs to get to 45 degrees of bank and makes it back. And I want to stress here, look at the conditions we were flying under. I mean, they were absolutely perfect. We had a little bit of light wind that was pretty much a headwind, if I remember, maybe a little bit of a crosswind from the left. Um, and it was a cool day. You can see we're wearing jackets, so density altitude was low. I mean, it was absolutely perfect conditions. And Luz is, is uh, she basically did a Bob Hoover routine on this, the energy management, where she, she just uh, comes back, lands gracefully, and rolls to a stop at exactly her starting point. I mean, she, she made the rest of us look really bad. <laughs> in all fairness, the 172 is probably the, the easiest airplane to perform this maneuver in. Its climb profile is very close to the glide profile. If you look at the two on the graph on four flight, and if your climb profile exceeds your glide profile, that's when you know you can do it. And it depends on how it's weighted. You know, four, four passengers and a full 172 might be a little bit different. And Luz, when she was practicing this maneuver and doing the 360 degree power off turn, I think she was saying that she consistently less, lost about 500 feet or less which was uh, you know, just a surprisingly low number, but, uh, but it, it goes to, um, to Brian's point about the Skyhawk being a really excellent airplane for, uh, for this, this maneuver. So uh, I have a colleague that wanted to try this in the 182 after he saw uh, this video here. So uh, he lives out in Montana, so we were up in his 182, and we, we briefed and practiced some turn back, similar scenario, very long runway, kind of open space out there. And we go up, and uh, it was about half fuel, and it was just um, he and I in his 182. Density altitude was probably around maybe 5,500, 6,000 feet. 
And what we found was we'd go up to 800 feet and we could do the turn back. And we were very, very diligent about pulling that prop back, as, uh, as Dave and Brian mentioned, to reduce the drag on the prop. And we noticed that about 800 feet, we could make it back to a simulated 4,000 foot runway. So we go to lunch and you know, we're sort of uh, knocking around, talking about different things. And we come back, he filled it up with fuel. And a 182 holds, uh, what, 96 gallons or something like that uh, of fuel. And uh, then the, density, the heat had come up. And now the density altitude was something like 7,000 feet, right? So we try the same thing, 7,000 feet density altitude, heavy weight, didn't come close to making it back. So it really illustrated to us the conditions and the parameters that you're using, the weight of your airplane really makes a difference because again, you're max performing the airplane and small, uh, small differences can really impact your performance here. How many people you have in the airplane, like Brian mentioned, how much fuel you have, what's the density altitude, all those things are factors. And so mitigate that risk. If you know your airplane can't do it with a high density altitude and you're at one of these airports where you have no options, leave in the morning. And Dave, now this is the uh, the Bonanza one, uh, and so I'll just let you talk through. Do you want to do you want to talk about it first? Or? Sure. It's um, this one was was uh, the the real eye opener for me. And this one this one uh, you know I, it was it was frankly it's a, a bit of a searing experience to because we're trying our best. We're trying to we're, we are I am I am trying to make it back to the runway, but um, when you make that turn and you see the runway threshold and you realize that it is just sinking in the windshield and it is not, you know, you are not going to get there. And now I'm committed. I've turned, the wind is behind me. You know, you just think, wow, this is a really, this is a really lonely feeling. You know, this was, this was, you have, you have enough time to, uh, to, to kind of stew on the fact that, you know, you, you, you made the wrong choice here. So, uh, so, but the, this is a, a, an A36 Bonanza, uh, full fuel, two occupants, 40 pounds of bags, and um, and we initiate the turn back at a little over a thousand. I think it was right at a thousand feet AGL. Okay. And once again, you'll see the uh, the green green space on the uh, on the takeoff, and you'll see that my turn back angle. Was uh, was not steep enough. It's it's. I was you know. In, I'll just in my in my own defense, I was really thinking about uh, positioning the airplane over you know in the most advantageous place over the ground, and that uh, that and I and I did not turn the the full 45 degrees of bank. So a couple of people have asked us on this one, you know, why'd you have two, or two people in this one and not the other airplanes? We just felt like with the retractable gear situation, we just wanted a safety pilot to make sure as it came in, you know, we, we, we were focusing on the basics to make sure we had that straight. Yeah, Dave, uh, Dave Roy did a great job of making sure I did not land gear up, which was, my, was <laughs> one of my concerns. But, um, but also, you know, this is a, this is a six seat airplane that, uh, that normally flies it. And, and this is very light, light to moderate loading, even for, uh, for, the, for the airplane. So you know, here we're climbing at VY, approaching 1,000 feet AGL. The, uh, the altimeter was zeroed. You pull the power, and, uh, and, and here, too, you know, the nose has got to come down to avoid the, uh, you know, it, it decelerates rapidly. So here's the the uh, a little shallower than than uh, than, I, than than I would have liked to see it. Frankly, I was surprised when I looked when I reviewed the video at at at, uh, at the the shallowness of the bank. But uh, you'll see the reason for that shallowness is that big gray or big green field ahead. Now you can see the runway starting to come into view, and this is where you have that sinking feeling that we are not going to get there. And um, we tried this three times, and it varied the bank angle, varied the speed. Here, I'm, I'm putting the gear down. It's like, I, I give up. You know, the outcome is clear, not going to make it. We're just going to land, uh, land normally. But, um, but, you know, I was 0 for 3. And, and the thing is, it wasn't even close. I mean, it, it's, it's a, you know, my impact point would have been half a mile from the airport it was not even on the airport property you know so it just it just really made an impression on me that that it's like hey note to self 
you ever have an engine failure on takeoff at the Bonanza, do not, do not attempt the turn back. I'd, I'd, I'd rather hit a brick wall into the wind than, um, than, than, uh, than, uh, uh, than land down, than, than a, a, attempt to land short and downwind. And the wind is a very important factor as well. This should never be attempted if you have a strong headwind. A strong headwind is going to reduce so much energy into the impact of landing into it. So if you may, and uh, also have an adverse effect on your ability to turn around, maybe overshoot the runway, and then have that tailwind on landing, giving you a lot more energy to have to crash into. So obviously, with a strong headwind, never try this. And I, and I say anything over 15 knots, you probably shouldn't do this. That's so, interesting because I was thinking that a, a strong headwind would make the turn back easy. I mean, you, you would, you would, uh, it would increase the likelihood that you would at least make it back to the airport property. I figured it, it would be a two-edged sword because now you've got to land with a strong tailwind. But, um, but that's interesting to your, that's an interesting point. So you brought up an, a good point that you could see on the video I didn't emphasize earlier, and that is it's not a 180-degree turn. As you can see, by the time you go take off on departure, if you depart straight ahead, by the time you start your turn, you've got to come and point back to the runway, fly back to the runway. Then you've got to have enough energy to turn around and align with the runway to land. So it's really more like a 270-degree turn. So... This is some of the takeaway, and guys, you can help me out here, but this is what we, what we came up with. When is the impossible turn possible? The right pilot in the right aircraft under the right conditions. And there's a lot, use current terminology, to unpack underneath that, right? There's a lot to look at when you're looking at what's the right pilot. It's somebody who's trained in this maneuver, who's proficient in this maneuver, and really important to me, who's ready for it. So if you decide, which I have based on this, that a turn back in a Super Cub is an option for me, then now I'm obligated before every takeoff, because you can't predict when you're going to lose your engine, but before every takeoff to determine, can I do it on this runway with these conditions, which direction am I going to turn, and how am I going to execute it? So, um, and regarding the... Regarding the proficiency, uh, practicing at altitude a gliding 45 degree turn and keeping it coordinated will be more challenging than you think. That kind of muscle, mem muscle memory is invaluable to hone in and, 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 and earn and, and, and become good at. So go up to altitude, practice the 45 degree gliding turn at, at best glide speed, 45 degree bank. You'll notice it takes a lot more pull than you think. The, the picture is different than you think. And the, uh, the rudder you're going to need is a little bit different than you think. Get the muscle memory down, Pat, practice that quite a bit, because that is where it's getting messed up when pilots attempt it. And, and on that note, the reason this is becoming a, a, such a, a controversial but very popular topic is that pilots are doing it anyway. They're told to go straight ahead. The rule of the day is go straight ahead. I'm going to go straight ahead. I'm going to go straight ahead. Engine failure. Oh, shoot, I'm turning. So they plan on it. They're taught to do it. And I'd be willing to bet that most of the accidents that ha have happened as a result of pilots attempting to make the turn back after an engine failure, they had been taught and were planning to go straight ahead. But the instinct is to go back. That's why we need to address it. Because you're gonna, if you're going to succumb to that instinct, you're better off being prepared for it. And the, uh, the, the, uh, the takeaway for me is that, that what Richard mentioned is the, uh, the really critical importance of the pre-takeoff briefing. You know, we all, we, you know, a lot of times it's fairly rudimentary. You know, it's like, hey, if we have an engine failure before V1, we're going to abort. If we have an engine failure after that, we're going to fly. And, we're gonna, and then, and then um, you know, it, 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 becomes, uh, it becomes fairly boilerplate. But... Um, but with this, with the, uh, with this now, you know, it's it's like I'm taking off in a bonanza, and it's like okay, pre-takeoff briefing briefing includes the fact that if an engine failure on takeoff means that I will not turn back, and that um, that I'm, that it's like we're gonna we're gonna keep the airplane under control, and um, and also you know the uh, the pre-takeoff briefing is the best chance to minimize that startle factor and three-second delay that was included in these in these uh these practice sessions you know it's it's like uh personally i was thinking that three seconds may not be long enough the actual startle factor may take longer but um 
but if you, if you brief it and you think about it and you commit to a plan of action before a break release, it just seems like that's how we minimize the, uh, the, the, uh, the length of that point, a period of indecision. And that's how we increase the odds of a better outcome. And I, and I agree with that pre-takeoff briefing advice 100%, but I change it a little bit. My pre-takeoff briefing is, if I'm, especially if I'm at an airport where there are no fields and nowhere to go, is that instead of saying, if the engine fails, I say, when the engine fails, so it's a mindset. I say, when the engine fails, we're going to do this, if I'm above this altitude. If it doesn't fail, my contingency plan is to just keep going to my destination. So if it fails, when it fails, I'm sorry, when it fails, I'm doing this. If it doesn't, we'll keep going. And you get the mindset of being prepared. So that next one, the airplane, when we first did this and we looked at the results, we thought, oh, glide ratio. You just need an airplane with a good glide ratio. But that's not really it. Because actually, the book glide ratio in a Bonanza is better than a 172. So it's not just glide ratio. Let's talk about that a little bit. What are the airplanes where we think it can make it back? Um, or w what are what the are conditions? The yeah, what are the characteristics? Yeah, I would say a climb ratio. Uh, you know, the, the climb ratio exceeds the glide ratio, then you can make it back. So in a Bonanza, if you're typically taking off and climbing out at a nice cruise, engine cooling 120, 130 knots, you're getting too far from the airport without getting enough altitude. So I think it's very important to, to affect that climb ratio when you are in one of these situations where there's no other options. So climate's something less than VY. I don't recommend VX in the Bonanza. I don't like that at all. Uh, but something less than VY to get to an altitude and maybe a slight turn as well to compensate for that because less turning will be involved coming back. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, I do want to stress, and it's only fair to do this, that I heard a lot from Bonanza pilots who just took exception, some of them, to the fact that you can make it in a Bonanza in their scenario. That was not our case. We didn't find that. So I, I kind of, my takeaway was some days when I'm flying a Bonanza, I'm just not going to try it. Even the people that have done it successfully in Bonanza, when you sort of break it down to the conditions and how they did it, it was a very difficult is a very difficult maneuver to do, and there are very tight conditions, I believe, that you could make it back. So my takeaway was just in an airplane like a Bonanza or a Navion, something like that, I'm just, I'm just not, it's not something I would attempt. I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the Steve, the, the title of the Steve Martin movie long time ago where he's, he's, about this, he's about to marry this woman who's this gold digging witch, and he stands in front of the mirror and he says, you know, Please, God, any sign that if there's any sign that I shouldn't do this, please, please let me know. And then there's all these alarm bells and <laughs> whistling fireworks. And, and he said, and then, you know, they, the, the fireworks end. And he said, just any, any sign at all. <laughs> and it was, uh, and, it, that, and that to me is the, uh, is, is, is the bonanza world of the people that were writing in because they've just watched this horrendous video of this terrible accident at Pembroke Pines in which a bonanza turned back, turned, you know, ended tragically. Then they watch, um, they watch me and my colleague Dave Roy, we're 0 for 3 and it's not even close. And sure, you know, our, our technique could have been a little better, but it's like, we missed it by a country mile, and yet they're saying, "Oh, but just just give us any sign, <laughs> you know." And so, to me, you know, there are airplanes like, um, you know, we're, we're flying a Epsilon, very great airplane, but very high wing loading. You know, turn back would not be an option here. You know, others, uh, you know, just it, I, I would just say, let's. It's I think we're all reluctant to admit that there are phases of flight where the risk is really high and takeoff is one of them. And we're all conscientious pilots and we want to mitigate those risks any way we can. And so, uh, so it's like we're looking for the, the, you know, the silver bullet that is going to protect ourselves and our passengers. And, uh, and I think that you know, the, 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 the start of this is just to admit that it's like, hey, there are certain fear periods of flight where we are vulnerable, and this, uh, you know, these, this, this, uh, this first thousand feet after takeoff, we're really vulnerable. We don't, in a single engine airplane, we don't have a lot of good options, and we, there's no, there's no silver bullet that'll, that'll bring us back every time. So this third issue of conditions, I want to stress because. 
It is very much conditionally dependent, as I mentioned in that 182 exercise. We could make it two hours later with more fuel and higher density altitude. We weren't even close. So you've really got to factor in the, uh, the conditions. Um, we've stressed that, I think, enough. If you believe it can work for you, we mentioned in our video uh, a couple times, please don't try this on your own to prove us right or prove us wrong. Um, this maneuver and this training maneuver has caused fatal accidents before, people attempting these maneuvers and practicing it. So the first thing to do is go do it at altitude with a CFI, and then from there work with the CFI on where you go in your airplane to figure out if it's a possibility for you. Um, remember, ours is a basic overview of four really high experienced pilots on an absolute perfect day to try it, so keep that in mind. And then finally, I want to stress, you know, Brian mentioned don't give up a sure thing in front of you, which, you know, I think most people would say it's to, if you got something in front of you, that's a much better option than the risky maneuver to turn back. And then we used to say in the Air Safety Institute, if you lose, your, uh, if you lose power on takeoff, go 30 degrees either side of the nose. And what I got from this is that's too limiting. You can really go forward of your 3-9 line, about 90 degrees either side. If you see something there, then, uh, then look for that. So expand your options there just a little bit, even on the straight ahead option. So we got about a minute and 20 seconds left, guys. So I want to go to, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, any consideration between a right turn and a left turn. So um, a couple of thoughts there. It could be, should be wind dependent, so which direction is the wind coming, and that ought to be in your pre-takeoff briefing because that could very much impact uh, your performance in the wind. And the other one is if you're in a side-by-side -side airplane, if you don't tell people anything and just say, hey, give me a 60-degree turn, 90% of the time they turn left because it's just more comfortable to them, they can see there. So all things being equal, you're probably going to be more comfortable on the left-hand turn. And consider obstacles and terrain, obviously. Good point, good point. And wind. Uh, yes, sir. You want to turn into the wind. Yeah, parallel runways, you know, uh, dissecting runways, I would say that once you, st once you focus on that turn back maneuver, you know, if you're executing that, now you're going to go to the closest piece of pavement that you can get, even if it's just the runway environment. A lot of times just getting back to the runway environment is going to be better than going into a neighborhood or a city yeah, or and, something and like that. And that's a good part of the brief. Dean. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You're running such a risk right there of getting in the way and of distracting a pilot from a really tense situation. That's my take. What do you guys say? Yeah, I would be saying a silent prayer not to stall. You know, but it's, but it's like, um, but I'm with Richard. Let's just hush and let him, let him handle it. Uh, I, I think there's not much you can say, and, and saying something would be distracting, but if I were to say something, I would say keep your ball centered and don't stall. Yes, sir. Did you guys hear that? Yeah, that's a fair point. The best glide range will not change with your weight. The best glide speed does change. I encourage my students and pilots to know what the best glide speed for the weight they're at at that time. So we're going to have to wrap it up for the next speaker to come in. Can I get you guys to join me and thank these guys for joining me on stage for the conversation? And thank you for joining us. If you haven't gone to our, you go to our YouTube channel at airsafetyinstitute.org on YouTube and uh, watch the video. Give us your feedback. Thanks for joining us.